What makes a cult classic? It's usually something that's genuinely great, but also misunderstood, combined with the passage of time, resulting in the subject having a hardcore fan base and a resurgence sometime later. Every medium has its own cult classics, including, of course, video games. One of my favorite things about doing this show for so many years is the direct line I have to fans who want to show me stuff that they love. Several years back, during Fan Appreciation Month, a fan named Patrick Gersey sent me a game, and ever since playing it for the very first time, I have been dying to play it again. I'll be exploring how I feel about cult classics and auteurship when I re-complete Earthbound. Yes! Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Completionist New Game Plus, the show where I am recompleting the first 123 episodes in the original Completionist lineup. Something I love is when a fan gives me a recommendation that turns out to be life-changing. It doesn't always happen often, but it happened with Earthbound, aka Mother 2, a Super NES game with a devoted and rabid fan base. Earthbound is a masterpiece that did something not a lot of cult classics do. It broke into the mainstream. It's always been one of the most striking and original JRPGs ever made because of the strong vision of the game's creator. And while I loved it the first time through, playing it again only deepens my appreciation of all of the work that went into bringing this game to life. It's kind of a gift that Earthbound has a lot of information out there about it and how it came to be, which isn't always the case for games developed in the early to mid 90s. Earthbound is largely the brainchild of Shikisato Itoi, an actor, writer, and all-round artist who was really interested in what games could do relative to film or music. He wanted to make a game that made people feel things. And even someone whose heart is as cold as mine fell in love with this game. Earthbound had a famously difficult development cycle. The game took five years to make, with Itoi saying at various times that he was afraid the game would never come out, much less ever be released in the United States. Thinking about it, it really is shocking that this game came out at all, much less attained cult status. Even the marketing for Earthbound in the US was wild. The game stands on its own, so it wasn't really being pushed as the next game in the Mother series or anything like that. Instead, Nintendo Power focused on scratch and sniff cards, and the game was even sold with a gigantic guidebook that is now an awesome collector's item. Compared to when the game first came out, and even the first time I played it, there have been a lot of awesome guidebooks made that celebrate the game and its legacy. Completing the game recently on Super Beer Brothers with Alex Fasciani, it became easy to see why this game had so much cultural impact. It's weird, hilarious, and just plain enjoyable to play. There's also an undercurrent of darkness that appeals to more mature sensibilities that was rare in other games from the mid-90s. Itoi took a ton of risks creating this game, and almost every single one of them pays off. Earthbound attained cult classic status by being unabashedly strange when other RPGs were focusing on dragons and magic. And in recent years, the characters themselves seep into the mainstream from being playable in the Super Smash Bros. series. And when Nintendo finally released not only Earthbound, but for the first time ever, Mother 1 in the US, which would be renamed Earthbound Beginnings on the Wii U eShop, both games went on to become bestsellers on the system and helped revive the fandom. Now that Earthbound is out on the 3DS as well as the SNES Classic, it's finally readily available to anyone who wants to play it. Pretty much a first for any game in the Mother series. This was a game that for many years was an insane collector's item, and still is to this day. So playing Earthbound for the first time, I was blown away by how strong strange and interesting it was. I loved the art design, the gameplay was really fun, and best of all, it's pretty damn straightforward and even relatively easy. Completing Earthbound is as simple as traveling the world to find the eight soundstones. And I remember this not being all that difficult since it's directly tied to the main path of the game. Along this journey, I'll be posing for photo ops and talking to everyone I can, getting level 99 and preparing for the future. But this is one of those games where completion is its own reward. No bestiary, no hidden super secret side quests, no alternate endings. Though fans of the series argue that getting the ultimate 
one out of 128 Sword of Kings drop is a part of the completion process, I would argue that by that logic, every enemy in the game that has a one out of 128 drop chance, that true completion would mean you'd have to do that for all of the enemies. And that just seems really overkill. I mean, who would want to do that? Oh my God, that's actually a thing? A one out of 128 run? Yeah, I'm not doing that. That's not completion. That's just masochism. I loved Earthbound the first time, and I'm so glad to have gone back to this wonderful game that makes me feel things and access my emotions. And as complex as that may sound, Earthbound is the perfect game to do that. As far as gameplay goes, Earthbound is a pretty standard Japanese role-playing game. However, the art design and direction on this game put it on a whole other level. Playing through it for the first time, I understood why it's considered a classic. But after playing it again, I appreciated it even more. That's possible. Is that possible? It's possible. Earthbound starts off like any adventure. There's a mysterious event in the hometown of an unlikely hero. In this case, a meteorite crashing next door to Ness's house in the middle of the night. Now for the sake of our video here in our playthrough, a lot of you are going to be annoyed, but we renamed Ness to Beard Musical Note, which we imagine sounded something like this. Bird. After investigating with the help of his dog and his friend Pokey, the worst person ever, Bird undertakes a traumatic mission with huge consequences. He must save the world from the malevolent being Gygus, with the help of a ragtag group of kids all from across the land. Yeah, so pretty typical RPG stuff here, right? But the execution is so unique because this game gets crazy. Playing Earthbound is like a drug trip that you've forgotten about. And replaying it was fascinating because of what I remembered from the first time and what didn't stick. It's like rewatching a half-remembered cartoon from your childhood and realizing that it still holds up. A nostalgic, fuzzy warmth that totally envelops you while also making you laugh when you least expect it. For example, the being that tasks Bird with saving the world is an alien the size of a fly who almost immediately gets killed by his mom. I had completely forgotten about this small detail the first time around, but it totally sets the tone for the rest of the game. It's a genuinely funny moment. With jokes poking fun at small town America while also appealing to kids and adults at the same time, Earthbound strikes a perfect balance of being emotional and funny. There's no cynicism anywhere, and I love the game's earnestness. Now, Earthbound was heavily inspired by the Dragon Quest series, which is easy to see in any battle screen. The layout of the battle menu looks nearly identical to a typical Dragon Quest skirmish, which is understandable given how big of a fan Itoi was of that series. But Earthbound still puts its own spin on things. Instead of fighting goblins or dragons, the kids of Earthbound battle against abstract art or the terrifying New Age retro hippie. Playing it again, I'm amazed by the novelty on display all throughout, and I'm probably not alone in saying that my first real exposure to Ness was playing as him in the first Super Smash Brothers for the Nintendo 64. And one of my favorite experiences during my first playthrough of Earthbound was finally seeing where all of Ness's attacks came from. Though now that I think about it, I wonder why in Smash he says PK Fire and PK Thunder instead of Sci Fire. Maybe that's how it was in the Japanese version. I guess it does stick out in the mind better if it's PK. It must be something like that. Of course, it's not just Ness in the party. Every kid in Earthbound is a treasure, and I just want them all to be safe and happy! There's Jeff, the genius inventor who lives in a boarding school and who fixes tools and toys to make badass reusable items. There's Pooh, a prince with an amazing hidden potential who has to overcome an existential crisis in order to join the rest of the party. And Paula, an incredibly powerful Psy user who also bashes enemies with a frying pan. In my humble opinion, she would have been a badass addition to the Smash Brothers roster. Paula for Smash, let's go! So Earthbound came out in 1994, and it feels nostalgic to the core. My first experience with this game was as a full-grown adult, but I love how much it reflected the era of its release. Landlines, riding bikes everywhere, just walking next door and hanging out with the neighbor kid. Playing it now, it's a little sad to see how many of those nice things are no longer relatable. Not to get all, get off my lawn, but I think one of the reasons Earthbound is timeless is that it unabashedly embraces its nostalgia. There are even some moments where the game asks the player to plug in some of their own personal tastes, such as naming the party members and choosing your favorite home-cooked meal. These choices came back later in some unexpected ways. And it's surprisingly affecting when Ness's mom says she's got pizza waiting for you, even if I just put something in there before the game had started that I thought would make me laugh. Every art design choice feels so careful and
been considered. When I first approached the game, I was completely charmed by the gorgeous graphics and character models, and they absolutely hold up. If anything, I'm double charmed this time through. Playing through this with my friends again, it was like I was able to appreciate for the first time each clever sight gag or cool location. Earthbound is one of those games where everyone who plays it has a specific area or sequence they love, or maybe even a character or relationship that resonates with them. For me, it always stuck out how you never were actually able to meet Ness's father. He talks to you on the phone to save your game, and he sends money to your bank account when you need it. But other than that, he's absent. Okay, so I could be totally wrong with this, but I think this is the game designers making a comment about parents sending their kids overseas while they work. But it's open for interpretation. Smash Ultimate even has a great nod to Ness's absent father in a spirit battle where you have to fight an invisible character, which I thought was incredibly clever because it's the fact that Ness's dad's not there, which I thought was an incredibly clever but sad reference. One of Earthbound's most memorable aspects is its kick-ass soundtrack. I was shocked by how good it was when I first played the game, and it's still a genuine pleasure to bop along to. Two incredible heavy hitters worked on it together. Nintendo's in-house composer, Hirokazu Tanaka, and producer Keiichi Suzuki, resulting in an unforgettable soundtrack. There are even sequences in the game that riff on the Blues Brothers and the Beatles in the form of the band The Runaway Five, who Ness and friends run into several times over the course of the story. I thought it was a treat before, and I still think it is. It's amazing that so many completely different parts of this game come together to form a cohesive whole. I liked the simple structure of this game before, and I honestly think it's aged really well. Ness and friends go from town to town, usually to search for some kind of key item to get somewhere else, to feed a boss, get a stone or another key item, and then move on to the next one. In between, there's talking to NPCs and turn-based battles, and it all just kind of works. I never really felt lost, which is unusual for certain older games. Even though I had forgotten a lot of specifics for my first time around, it didn't take away from my enjoyment, even for a little. There are so many little details that I didn't really pick up on or notice a few years ago. One of my favorite things about the battle system is the rolling HP bar, which ticks down as you take damage. If you're fast enough, you can heal yourself before the damage rolls down to zero and save your characters from death. This adds a little more strategy in the turn-based portions and makes tense fights feel even more tense. However, one big gripe that I just could not get past is the inventory management. It's just bad. It irked me previously, but it really stuck out to me with how rough it is here. However, in the most recent playthrough, I did appreciate the steps that were at least attempted to make it slightly less bad. The S Cargo Express can be summoned almost anywhere to store and return items to, which makes it slightly easier to handle the fact that the key items are always eating up inventory slots. It's not ideal, but it didn't ruin the game for me. And as I mentioned earlier, Yes, there are some secret items that have a 1 in 128 chance of dropping from certain enemies during combat. However, these items aren't all that necessary for beating the game and are more of a fun bonus than anything. Yes, I did earn the Sword of Kings by defeating hundreds of Starman supers, but I definitely had no interest in doing a 1 out of 128 run just for the sake of doing it. I'd rather just experience Earthbound on my own terms, and these bonus items don't add all that much to an already fantastic game. Man, I haven't even mentioned Mr. Saturn, which is a strange race of nose people who speak in a nonsense language, and offer Ness and his friends coffee breaks that are incredibly fourth wall breaking. Finding Saturn Valley during my first playthrough felt like a weirdly special moment, and it's just as special finding it again. Earthbound has always been weird and heartfelt, but the Saturns are the perfect encapsulation of that game's weirdness. At the end of the day, I loved Earthbound another time. The battle system is real fun, but the best parts of the game are its humor and heart, and playing it another time only helped me appreciate what was already there even more. By leaning hard into the nostalgia and having an earnest tone all the way through, Earthbound earns its big moments and becomes truly memorable and interesting. It's no mystery why this game is a fan favorite, and I'm glad that I get to continue the tradition of passing on a cult classic to a new generation. Earthbound is such a unique game that it's almost a little disappointing that there isn't really a completion bonus for doing everything. I say almost because at the end of my first video, I thought the game was so moving, I didn't even care that there weren't any secret endings or anything like that. And I still fall on that side of the equation. Defeating Gygus really is its own completion bonus. Interestingly, the final boss isn't really a test of skills you've learned along the way. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what level Ness is, or if you found or fixed every mention of Jeff's, 
where he even found Pooh's ultimate weapon. Because to beat the final enemy, you simply have to pray. It's a beautiful moment. It really affected me during my first playthrough and showed me that a game could be artistic without being grinding to get to the highest numbers possible. I still feel that way. And I love that the game's ending is still powerful even after a one playthrough. After the final battle, you are given the option to go back and talk to all the NPCs you've come across and explore the world once again. But there really isn't anything else to do. It feels bittersweet, but also like a logical conclusion. Rather than end on the most bombastic moment, Earthbound closes with quiet contemplation and dinner with mom. It's sweet, moving, and something that I wish showed up in games more often. When I re-completed Earthbound, there were five deaths, mostly due to me not having enough cheeseburgers on me to heal early on. Eight sanctuaries visited, each providing a quiet moment after a tough fight. 187 Starman Supers defeated while I was grinding for the Sword of Kings. 86 hours of total playtime. And one delicious pizza shared with my family at the very end. I came to the conclusion at the end of my first video about Earthbound that it's much more than just a standard RPG. I thought it was wonderfully artistic, extremely heartfelt, a reconstruction of a lot of tropes that makes turn-based RPGs great, and I gave the game a complete it. Sure, there's not really anything extra on top of what's already there, but the music, the art style, everything about it is instantly iconic and wonderful. I'll always treasure the card I got from Gersey. But even if you don't have access to the original version of the game, it's easier than ever to play it today, and I highly recommend you do so. The game is a Stone Cold classic. So, with that in mind guys, I still give this game my completionist rating of Complete It. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like the show, hit that like button, subscribe down below, hit the bell, and watch all of our videos. We do new videos every Wednesday and Saturday. Guys, I've been Gerard the Completionist, and I'll see you next week for another brand new episode. Bye.